在接近绝对零度的世界里，一场颠覆人类计算史的革命正悄然诞生。微软用了将近二十年时间，将科幻小说中的量子未来雕刻进一名名为 Mayo n a n a 的芯片之中。这不仅是微软在量子计算领域的重大突破，也是我们人类计算能力的一次质的飞跃。啊，大家好，这里是零度解说，今天我们就来探讨一下最近这款非常火的量子芯片究竟有何特别之处。众所周知啊。量子计算机的核心是量子比特，类似于我们在经典计算机中使用二进制信息单位。然而，量子比特的稳定性一直是量子计算发展中的最大难题，因为它们是极其脆弱的，容易受到环境噪声的干扰，从而导致计算错误或者数据丢失。正是这个问题啊，阻碍了量子计算的快速发展。但是，微软最近发布的这款 m y o n a n a One 量子芯片，采用的是一种全新的解决方案，用特殊手段创造一种全新的物质状态。也就是这个拓扑体物质，通过这一突破呀、啊，微软成功观测并控制了马约纳纳离子，使得量子比特更加稳定。根据微软官方透露啊，这个拓扑体使用了生化铟和铝，并通过原子级精确设计来构建拓扑体导体线材，从而生产出了一种类似于量子时代的晶体管。那么这种拓扑体量子比特跟传统物质相比有何特别之处呢？在经过实验验证发现啊。当拓扑体导线材被冷却至接近绝对零度之后，并通过质量调节，便可在两端形成马约纳纳零能膜。它和传统的量子比特相比，马约纳纳量子比特更加稳定，而且尺寸更小，并且可数字控制，因为它具有独特的拓扑保护属性，可以更好的重组和处理量子信息。当然，除了创造马约纳纳粒子外，微软还曾经开发了全新的测量方法，其精确度高到能够检测超导线中十亿个和十亿零一个粒子之间的差异。通过这项技术的突破，使得计算机可以更加清晰地识别量子比特的状态，并优化量子计算的过程。而且通过电压脉冲开关，微软还简化了测量操作，为构建可扩展的量子计算机铺平了道路。当然，微软的终极目标远不止这些，他们是希望在一块巴掌大小的芯片上集成100万个量子比特。因为根据微软技术研究员克里斯塔斯沃尔表示，理解这些新型材料的复杂性，正是我们需要量子计算机的原因。有了可扩展的量子计算机。我们将能够预测并创造出更先进的材料，从而更好的推动下一代量子计算机的发展。这是我们人类未来科技发展的重要方向。它不仅能够推动材料科学、人工智能、制药等多个行业的发展，还可能彻底改变计算世界的格局。同时，量子芯片的发展也可能会对当前去中心化的加密货币造成不小的冲击。接下来，我们就来一起看一下微软官方对这款量子芯片的详细介绍。What would the world look like with a computer that could accurately model the laws of nature? That's the promise of quantum computing, but there have always been limitations. Now, as one of our longest-running research projects, our team at Microsoft has been able to take a subatomic particle that has only been theorized until now, and not only observe it but control it, creating an entirely new material. And a new architecture for quantum computing, one that can scale to millions of qubits on a single chip. This is not a work of science; it's a work of science and art. I gotta be honest; some of these ideas are a little science fiction sounding. It will solve problems unsolvable by the combined power of all the world's compute today. And promises to revolutionize fields such as medicine, material science, and our understanding of the natural world. Our first quantum processor based on this architecture is the Majorana One. Yeah, I've always been fascinated with puzzles and. Challenges and a mixture of mathematics and computers, and so when I learned that there was this type of computer that didn't exist yet but could solve problems that we couldn't solve with our digital, you know, all of the computers we had, I was just fascinated. I wanted to learn. Well, how can I help that computer be built? Over the years, I ran into problems that I could not solve on the most powerful computers, but then over time, I realized, hey, I could solve that if I had a quantum computer. A laptop can solve a problem of. Ten electrons. A supercomputer can solve a problem of twenty electrons, but no classical computer in the world can exactly solve the behavior of thirty or forty or fifty electrons. 
The number 30, 40, 50 electrons, those numbers are seemingly small, but require up to lifetime in the universe timescales to solve with all of the world's computers operating together. That's until you have a scaled quantum computer that can solve these problems efficiently. These calculations are so complicated that then if the classical computer was as big as this entire planet, it would still not be able to compute it, just to give you a construct of scale. And a quantum computer can do it, and can do it very, very well. At the core of a quantum computer are these qubits. Qubits are like our classical bits, right? These are essentially zeros and ones um, in a transistor. Um, and we need the analog of that in quantum computing. The analog is a qubit, a quantum bit, that serves as that core information unit. It's where we store the information and then we process on those qubits uh, to create computation and ultimately you know, get solutions back out. Now there's many different ways, right, to create a qubit. The reason quantum computing has been so slow to progress is that the industry has been struggling with problems making qubits reliable and resistant to noise. Progress has been incremental. The challenge is qubits are actually pretty delicate in general, so you need underlying qubits that are, that are really stable. But you don't want that to come at a cost because uh, you don't want your underlying qubits to be really big. That's one way to make them more stable is have them really big. But if they're really big and you're still gonna need many of them, then you know, how are you gonna fit them all into, into your system? You don't wanna deal with something the size of a, of, a, of a warehouse. Then the second thing is you don't want to, the qubits end up being slow, right? Because they, if, if, the, if the price you pay for getting something stable is you have to go really slowly, then a computation that might take you a month ends up taking your decade, and that's not you, then it's not useful. People in the early days of computation used vacuum tubes, and then that technology, actually, you could build very good computers with it, and then the transistor was invented, and you know the earliest transistors weren't necessarily that great, but it became clearer over time as the transistor developed and the integrated circuit developed that this was gonna be the technology of the future. In that spirit that you know, the first generation of qubits may not be what gets us to the next stage where we can really solve the kind of problems I was mentioning that are really important. And so we might need to invent a material and therefore a quantum processing unit that has the right properties. So for us, we want something that has some built-in level of error protection. And a lot of those ideas actually were explored in the context of software of quantum error correcting codes, but you can actually build a lot of those ideas into hardware. So. The way you design that qubit matters. We see the states of matter every day. Solids keep their shape, liquids vary but keep their volume, gases expand to fill the space they're in, all defined ultimately by how their atoms behave. But what if there were more? What if, under the right conditions, you could engineer more? states that have only ever been theorized that would change how subatomic particles actually behave? A hundred years ago, mathematicians predicted one such new state of matter, the topological state. And since then, researchers have been looking for a very specific, very useful quasi-particle within it, the Majorana particle. Last year, we were able to observe it for the first time. And this year, we're able to control it and use its unique properties to build a topoconductor, a new type of semiconductor that operates also as a superconductor. With this material, we can build a whole new foundational architecture for our quantum computers, a topological core allowing us to scale to not tens or hundreds of qubits on a chip, but millions, all in the palm of your hand. Majorana's theory showed that mathematically it's possible to have a particle that is its own antiparticle. That means you can take two of these particles and you bring them together, and they could annihilate and there's nothing left. Or you could take two particles and you bring them together and you just have two particles. Sometimes it's 
nothing, the zero state, and sometimes it's the electron, the one state. So it really has taken quite some thinking, right? Some time to design a device, design a chip that can enable measurement of this literally elusive particle. We've designed a chip that is able to measure the presence of Majorana. Majorana allows us to create a topological qubit. A topological qubit is reliable, small, and controllable. This solves the noise problem that creates errors in qubits. Now that we have these topological qubits, we're able to build an entirely new quantum architecture, the topological core, which can scale to a million topological qubits on a tiny chip. Every single atom in this chip is placed purposefully. It is constructed from ground up. It is entirely a new state of matter. Think of us as building the picture by painting it atom by atom. In a regular chip, the computation is done using electrons. We don't use electrons for compute. We use Majoranas for compute. It's an entirely new particle. It's half electron. When we look at the design of this chip, right, first of all, you can fit so much on just a small form factor, right? This chip can store over a million qubits, right? Over a million can fit on just this small form factor. In addition, we don't want to wait centuries or millennia for a solution. And so this chip also offers the right speed to get solutions from the chip in a reasonable, efficient you know, amount of time. That's the beauty in this qubit design, the topological qubit. It has the right size, the right speed, and the right type of controllability. And all of that together means that it has an ability to scale like no other. The way the system that we are constructing works is you have the quantum accelerator, you have a classical machine that works with it and, and uh, controls it, and then you have the application that essentially goes between classical and quantum depending on which problem it's, it's trying to solve. Once the computations are done, the results are resynthesized on the classical side and produced back to the user as a one complete answer. Where the quantum machine shines, it is able to do simulations, particularly in chemistry and materials, that are extremely accurate, as accurate in, as an actual wet lab experiment. Imagine a world where a scientist computes the material that they want and they compute it to the accuracy that it's first time right. So when you walk into a lab, you don't need to experiment anymore. Imagine a battery that you charge it once and you never have to worry about discharging. What can you do with a million qubits? In the last few years, there's an explosion of artificial intelligence, right? Co-pilots, and what's so inspiring about a quantum computer is that with a quantum computer augmenting the AI capability, it can help more, you know, drive even more discovery. What makes me excited about quantum computing is that it will, will give us the tool to tackle many of these challenges at the fundamental level by creating new chemicals, new drugs, new enzymes for food production. Honestly, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing right now because this is something we've thought about for a while, years or more. We call the ages of mankind by materials. We've talked about the Stone Age, we've talked about the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, the Steel Age, the Silicon Age. Materials define our culture, define our mankind, define our progress. Thus, what could be more powerful than having a machine that can let you radically change the way we work with materials? Our leadership has been has been working on this program for the last 17 years. It is the longest running research program in the company. And after 17 years, uh, when we are showcasing our results, we are show showcasing results that are not just incredible, they're real.
。那么微软这项技术的突破，是否会成为量子计算时代的开端？让我们拭目以待